uh, yes, hello. I see that there is a message that is available. So uh, the floor is yours. Very good. Hello. Hi. Um, let me just ask. I'll just bring this up if you give me two seconds here. You should be able to see my screen right now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, we can see it, but you need to uh, make it full screen. Does that work for all? That should work now. Uh, yeah, now it's okay. Okay, very good. So hello, good day. My name is uh, actually good, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Um, Today, uh, I've been asked to talk about soil biology and microbial fertilizers from, the, from this perspective. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Michael Warren. I'm the CEO of a company called Earth Alive Clean Technologies. We're a Montreal, Canada-based uh, microbial inoculum company. Uh, fundamentally, what we do is we work with various uh, microorganisms to uh, solve industrial challenges. And so uh, one of those, uh, one of the, the, the aspects that we, we try to award is uh, agriculture, uh, given it's, in and we've been at it for since 20, in agriculture since 2014. And so I'll go through a little bit of what it is that we've been doing. Uh, and, and, and before that, actually go a little bit wider and look at how uh, using, um, microbial fertilizer, biofertilizers or inoculum, however you want to call them, uh, really has an impact from a, from a productive point of view. And so I like to start with this. Um, that's a juniper tree and, and you might find that kind of an interesting way of starting a presentation. But um, if you look at this tree, you know, we've always been thought that plants can only really grow in this beautiful soil and, and, and they need to have all these, you know, uh, they need to have enough fertility in the soil, they need to have enough access to water, and so on and so forth. And if you look at this tree and you look at where its roots are going, they're going into a rock. And, you know, I saw this, this is in, in the, at the Mojave, uh, this is in the, not in the Mojave, I'm sorry, this is in the um, Navajo National Monument in Northern Arizona, which is quite desertic in terms of an environment. Um, and you might think, well, the roots get underneath and there's some soil there. But the reality is that's where that tree is. That's right up a cliff face. Um, and there's some other vegetation, but on the other side of that is a cliff and I didn't want to kill myself getting, getting to it. But you can see how somehow this tree has managed to survive in very harsh climates uh, with very little access to what we would consider a, a, a pleasant environment for growing. And the question is, how does how is this tree able to get the nutrients that it's getting? Um, modern agronomy tells us that you know we need to give it nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium. Uh, we need to give it you know twenty seven elements for it to grow. Yet somehow this tree manages to sustain life out of rock. So how does it do it? Well, it's quite simple. It's microbiology, it's a, ver a slew of various microorganisms that are able to extract and allow this plant to thrive. Now, it's not humongous, but nonetheless, it's doing quite well. So what is soil? If a plant can sit in a rock and survive, what is soil? Because obviously a plant does not need soil. It needs the capacity in the organisms to sustain it, just like we do. And so soil, you know, really becomes the stomach of a plant. If we think of humans or animals, um, we extract nutrients from our micro, uh, from you know, the biology in our gut, uh, just like animals get them. So a cow has a rumen, it's, a, it, it's an oxygen deprived environment, so is ours. Um, in the soil, it's actually an oxygen rich environment, it's a probiotic. So if you think of a probiotic that we consume for humans, um, this is very similar in, in, in its form. And so you know, when we started this journey, we sort of looked at how did we do agriculture and why? 
And when we look at agriculture, we started off with plows and we started off, you know, eventually we got tractors and we got bigger and bigger tractors. Um, always able to work the physical aspect of soil and that increased our yields. With time, roughly around time of World War, at the end of World War II, um, we had access to incredible chemicals for herbicides, pesticides, all kinds of asides, um, and chemical fertilizers. And this again, increased our yield significantly. We could produce tons of cheap food. And the reality is that today when we look at our yields and we look at the impact, um, it's starting to go down despite the fact that our chemistry has, is now at a level where we've never been before. And so for us, really the next point is, and, and technology is allowing us to do this today because it's taken us quite some time to really understand what's going on in the soil, is what we call the biological inflection point, is that we now are able to use microbiology to our benefit in terms that we're able to be a lot more segment, a lot more precise with our actions. And so moving forward here, being mindful of time, um, this, is a, this is a way that I like to, 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 to kind of sum up the way that we've approached it. We've mastered our very good at managing physical characteristics. Um, wherever we are in the world today, we have a tool to be able to open up that soil and make our plants grow in it. We've mastered the chemical aspect of it. And when I talk about uh, a chemical aspect of it, whether it be synthetic or organic, um, I see them very similar in terms of these are, these are the nutrients the plants are having access to, or the methodology that we have to bring these uh, molecules to a plant. Now, the third one, and the one that everything kind of sits on is biology. Now, we never actually really recognized it as biology. We just assumed that it worked. Um, however, in many systems today, we start to see, the, despite the fact that we're working the physical and chemical aspects of soil, we're starting to see a, a lot of imbalances happen. And why is that? It's because the biology underneath is starting to have more and more issues. The biology has failed. And why is that? Is that quite simply between working and exposing bare soil to the, to the, to the sun and to the elements and constantly reworking it and putting in um, some chemistry that can sometimes have a negative impact on soil biology, um, we're constantly putting pressure on it and it is decreasing. And so if you were to compare it again to the human body, um, if you have to take two weeks of antibiotics, you're completely flushing out your, your body of, of bacteria. And then you're having a hard time setting it up again. You have to restart the system. And so often, a doctor will tell you, well, take your two weeks worth of antibiotics and then take a probiotic to start to get your, 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 your system going again. Let's get your intestinal flora going again. Well, today we're facing a very similar challenge in soil. We have soils that have been extremely depleted of biology. And when we're talking about biology, this is what we're talking about. I apologize, this, this, uh, this graph is in Spanish. I only noticed it this morning uh, when, I was, when I was going through it again. Um, but fundamentally, if we look on, on the slide here, you know, the nematodes, the mycorrhizal fungus and various other fungus and the bacteria are sort of those fundamental actors in the soil that are really working for plants. And these are the ones that are sort of the, the fundamental of how we're able to break down plant material to access what is in the soil and convert into something the plants can use. Now, with that, there's an entire cycle that goes with it. And so when we start hitting and having an impact on some of the fundamentals of, of a system, it goes all the way up. And so in some places in the world today, we see less and less bugs, actually. You know, one of the big comments that we get in Canada is when you drive through the countryside, there's not as many bugs on your car windshield as there were in the past. It certainly is an indication that there is something wrong with the system. So the good, the good, the good, the bad, and the ugly, certainly over the last 18 months, we have been made aware of microorganisms that you know, are bad. And we've all gone through gallons of antimicrobial 
slurries to try to limit our imp the, the impact that the microorganisms can have on us. The reality is that in soil, the majority of microorganisms are positive actors. And so these are actors that strengthen the immune response of a plant, protect against pathogens, help in, nu in nutrient acquisition, um, assist in growth and development, help with stresses. And so some bacteria actually will help a plant weather a drought and, and just your standard physiology and metabolism. And, the, and, the, and the, the flip side to that is that there are some bad bacteria, but if we're in a good aerobic system, we're able to beat them out. They're much smaller in quantities. And again, the ugly food contamination issues, these bacteria can be pushed away if we're able to make sure that our fundamental microbiology in the soil is positive and aerobic. Aerobic, for anyone who's not sure, is in an oxygen-rich environment. When we start having a lot of compaction, we end up having some, ana some anaerobic, and a lot of times this is where um, some of the more negative aspects of some, some uh, excuse me, some soil pathogens will come out. But fundamentally, most microbes are not a bad thing. And so what can they do? The most important thing and the most interesting thing in my mind is that microbes are transforming nutrients from different types of forms. They're able to plant, or we're able to take inorganic nutrients and make them into something the plants can use. Uh, microbes have got the ability to break down and mineralize um, in, ingredients or molecules in the soil that are not available to the plant. So again, when we're talking, let's compare it to a human being. If a bacteria is able to turn something that we cannot eat and ingest and digest into something that it can, that becomes very interesting because the entire transformation process is no longer a human activity that we bring to the plant. The plant has got the capacity through its systems to work with those microorganisms to access that food. There's tons of food in the soil. It's just not necessarily bioavailable. Um, there's also some really interesting uh, research that's happening that is demonstrating how microbes have got abil the ability to store. Whichever system you're more comfortable with, whether it be a conventional system using you know, synthetic inputs or an organic system, or a generative system or wherever down the track or wherever in the scale you wish to produce food at. Um, this is very interesting because nutrient runoff is a big issue. Um, we see it in the conventional system, it's a reality. A lot of the nutrients are running off into the water. We end up with green, with the dead zones in, in various lakes, streams in the ocean. And the ability, if we're able to have enough microbes there that can absorb more and more of these nutrients and store them in a living system, keeping them close to a plant, uh, it increases the return that we have on that investment uh, and decreases the environmental impact. And then again, the probably the most important aspect of this is the, min is the mineral transformation. So there are different types of nitrogen out there and microbes have got the capacity of transfer them from a nitrate to an ammonium or an ammonium to a nitrate. And that becomes very interesting because depending on where we are in a plant's growth, um, this is where we want those microbes to be able to do things for us. And so, uh, again, I apologize for the Spanish, um, and I'll make sure that, that these are available in English to anybody who'd like them. But, you know, if we look at nitrogen, nitrogen is probably one of the best examples. Um, for anyone who's comfortable with agronomy, some plants uh, in, in conjunction or in symbiotis with a different types of microorganisms have got the ability to nodulate nitrogen. And so they'll take gaseous nitrogen and then through their plant, through the plant, are able to store nitrogen in their root system in a nodule. Now those nodules um, are a storage of nitrogen and those plants have got access to that nitrogen, but more often than not, um, by the time that plant comes to fruition, um, there's some excess and that excess stays in the soil. But there's also bacteria that are able to take gaseous nitrogen and bind it into the soil uh, without having a host plant, nitrogen fixers. And 
So this was one aspect of, uh, when we started uh, way back when that we thought was quite interesting. I, I, you know, if we have the ability to replicate these bacteria, and, and I'm not talking about genetically modifying them or any way or in any way, shape, or form. I'm simply speaking about uh, having access to a bacteria and being able to replicate it and control it and have it stabilized. Um, then we're able to inoculate a field with beneficial bacteria that are able to fix their own nitrogen in a in an absolutely organic way, the way that they were developed to be done. Um, and so these are really interesting aspects of how we can use microbiology in an organic or non-organic, whichever you decide, um, to have access to nitrogen. Air is 72% nitrogen. Now, we've managed to figure out how to, in a, in, in a, in a chemical system, I guess we would say, to get that, uh, that, you know, using a lot of pressure, using a lot of energy, we're able to make nitrogen. But bacteria are able to do it by themselves. And so managing biology on your fields, wherever you are, allows you to do that. And that's a humongous benefit. Um, the same thing for phosphorus. So phosphorus, again, is a difficult, you know, there's plenty of it around. Uh, it's just not necessarily a bioavailable form. And biology has got the capacity to take that molecule that the plant cannot ingest and biology can break it down and get access to it and bring it to a plant so the plant can use it and render it into something that is bioavailable. And it's interesting because more, you know, as research and, and various um, hypotheses come forward, today, you know, there's some talk about how uh, a great deal of the phosphorus that comes from um, the deserts in North Africa are actually the phosphorus that is fertilizing the Amazon. And so that dust travels around the world settles down in the Amazon and bacteria are able to take those dust particles and break them down into something that plants can absorb. So again, if we're able to understand our biology in our fields, we're able to fix our own nitrogen and we're able to make our own or get access to phosphorus molecules for our plants to have. And so it seems to me that by managing biology properly, we can significantly reduce our load of necessary inputs. And when we're talking about remote locations, uh, it becomes interesting, it becomes important because one of the biggest costs to many farmers is fertilizers. And some of the biggest costs of fertilizers are the transport of those fertilizers to where we need them to be. When we're talking about using hundreds of pounds per acre, uh, it becomes very difficult. Now, I understand that a lot of emergent systems we're not using hundreds of pounds compared to perhaps a, a corn farmer in, in Ohio or somebody growing bananas in Dominican Republic. But fundamentally, what we're demonstrating here, what we're talking about is the capacity to make the best of the soil you have where you are by managing the biology rather than bringing excess inputs. And then finally, um, I think this is probably the most um, pertinent point of managing soil biology and creating soil structure. And this is actually a product that we, or this is using these principles, we developed another product for road dust abatement that we use in the mining sector. And so as I'm sure you're all very familiar when you're driving down a country road that is unpaved, you get a great big cloud of dust behind you. And Earth Alive has been able uh, in 2012 to come up with a product we call it EA1. Um, to come up with a microbial slurry that we can spray into a roadbed and the bacteria secrete binders and glues that bind those particles together and eliminate the dust in an absolutely organic way. And uh, through what we refer to as agglomeration. Now, coming back to ecology and coming back to growing food and agriculture, why is this important? Well, anyone who, if, if you're comfortable with gardening or farming and you've stuck your hands in soil, anyone actually, if you've ever stuck your hands in soil and lift them and them up, uh, two things can happen. Either it runs through your fingers a little bit like sand um, or you end up with uh, clumps. Now, depending on your type of soil, it varies a little bit, but fundamentally it's pretty common that you'll have the, one of those two actions. And the healthier your soil and the more microbial, uh, my, the more microbial life there is in that soil, the, the, the bigger the clumps are gonna be. And so, you know, if you go in your garden, you stick your hands up and they come up, 
you're not getting sand running through your fingers. Um, it's often what we, we, we discussed to be the difference between dirt and soil. Dirt will run through your fingers, soil will stay because we're creating soil structure. Bacteria are binding pieces together and reorganizing them in such a way that they're holding water better, that the biology is able to work in that environment and that we're able to work at extracting as much nutrition as we can from that soil. And then finally, control, controlling diseases. Um, I don't think it's, it's a far stretched to say that a, an organism that is in health has got a higher capacity to repel uh, invaders. And so we also see there's, there's, and there's an entire world of it, of bioprotection, which is using specific organisms to protect plants. Um, but further than that, if you're able to have a soil that is healthy, the plants that grow on top of it have, are also able to do so. And, and so, uh, when they're exposed to various stimulants, they're able to defend themselves. They're able to plant a response. Through the mycorrhizal network, plants are able to work together. I know it sounds a little bit strange to some, but plants have got the capacity to work together to ward off invaders. And more importantly, in a world that is changing, especially from a climatic point of view or from a climate point of view, um, we're able to increase stress tolerances. And this is becoming a big issue because if plants are able to deal better with drought or heat or wet, uh, these are things that are very important. And so when we look at these various you know, issues that, plant, that, that microbiology can bring to a soil, it seems to me, uh, or to us at least, that it's a fundamental aspect of managing proper growth. So, Simple solutions. And so we, we came up with a product that was called Soil Activator a few years ago, which is nitrogen fixers, phosphate solubilizers, and chelators. And I can speak to them and to what we've been able to do with them. Um, and I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit better perspective of how it is that this is a simple way of adopting principles to facilitate growth. Uh, now, whether it's mine or anybody else's, as long as the quality is there, that's what's important. But the great thing about working with microbiology is that it's a simple solution. It's a soil-oriented solution. It's not a plant-by-plant -plant system. What we're interested in is getting the entirety of that field to be in a better system to help whatever is on top of it grow better. And how does that do that? Well, the sun hits the leaves, we get we get um, the plants are able to photosynthesize, photosynthesize and in return uh, through their root system the plants put out an exudate and they react and talk with the different microorganisms to get what they need but the great thing is that to get those microbes out into that field and to increase the numbers of specific microbes that we're looking for um, it's relatively simple because you're able to mix it with the seed as a seed coating system. You're able to put into water or into a liquid and be able to spray it out into your field or drench it out into your field. You can mix it with manures or composts. Uh, I apologize for the typo there. Um, you can mix it with whatever system you're currently working. And that's important because if you're going out and you're working in a system, um, more time is not necessarily the solution. And so, for us, what we thought was really important is finding a way of making this in such a way that anyone can use it. And so after that, it's whatever's growing on top works with it because it's just a natural response. And whether it's uh, an avocado, a pineapple, a tomato, or a grape, um, the plants are all looking for the same thing, very much like human beings. Whether you eat um, your dinner in New York City or in Europe or in Africa, the way your digestive tract is looking for to break down those nutrients is very similar. Now there's some variations depending where you are and on your diet and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, we're all working the same way and plants are very similar that way. Um, I put in the bottom here, you see a small triangle of grass. This is a spent mine uh, in Northern Canada. Um, as you can see, there's not a lot growing there. There should be. Uh, but after years uh, of, of work on it, 
uh, the biology is is lacking, for lack of a better word. Uh, furthermore, it's in a very remote system, and therefore, or in it's in a subarctic system. So, getting things to grow takes a very long period of time. Getting soil biology to grow properly takes a very long time. And so, this was a challenge for us. We thought it was quite interesting, and so we went in and started managing the soil biology, rather than importing thousands of tons of topsoil. Um, we just really focused on working that soil biology. And lo and behold, we were able to get plants to grow again. And so we went from rather than having to manage tons of soil to put a layer on top to encapsulate it, to actually getting the system to work for itself, just by inoculation, which is a very different way of looking at the problem. Now, I was speaking of modes of actions throughout the presentations, and these are things that I thought or that we thought were very important again, because producing sustainable nitrogen is, is an important part of the package. How, how many units of nitrogen are we able to get made by a system by itself without human intervention, bringing nitrogen in? Uh, chelating iron, solubilizing phosphate, as we spoke about, sol uh, solubilizing silica and zinc, the capacity to break down organic material, Increasing soil retention, and increasing soil retention is a really important one because we often attribute soil retention to uh, organic material, and, and it is and it is in fact very important. Every time you're able to increase your soil organic material by one percent, um, if I'm not mistaken, you're looking at uh, roughly being able to hold about twenty thousand liters of water per acre, and so that's very significant if you're in an arid environment. Um, well, it's significant everywhere you go, but if you're in an, an arid environment and you're able to bring your, your soil organic material up, you're looking at be able to hold whatever moisture, or whatever uh, um, precipitation there is, you're able to hold more of it in your soil, uh, which has a direct impact on irrigation. In managing biology, again, when you were starting to work with, you know, the, 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 how the bacteria are putting glues together and, and working on that soil structure will also help with that. And then finally, helping promote root development. The mycorrhizal networks and the bacteria and the soil are able to help those roots have a better reach. And so we're increasing the capacity of those plants to reach nutrients in the soil. And so these are all modes of action that we thought were really important and how we've kind of gone forward in, in packaging them into a product. And then we can look at, you know, what is the impact on yield? And this is where we started back in 2014. It was, you know, really a question of how much yield are we able to, build? how much more food are we able to grow? And that was the initial question. And, you know, we've worked all over the world at this point. Um, I think we've run trials in 16 or 17 different countries between um, Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, North America, and South America. We've worked on about 50 different crops, growing anything from bananas and squash and maize to uh, you know, um, passion fruit and palm oil and all kinds of different crops to really look at what the impact was. Um, and so we're able to get more yield. Um, but one of the things throughout our research that has come up is it's not only about the yield. What if there was other things that were important to food um, that we were able to have an impact on using microbiology and, and managing that biology, um, or I refer to it as microbial active soils. How, how are, what else are we able to get out of it? Um, and this is where I think, oh, I'm sorry, you're not gonna see this properly here. Ah, bear with me. This is where I think there's a lot of opportunities or there, there's some interesting factors. We started looking at what the nutrient content of food was. We started looking at the bricks. We started looking at nutrition. We look at, started looking at vitamins. We started looking at protein. And what we found is that the better we're able to manage our soils from a, from a, a, a microbial point of view, the healthier the soil, the healthier the food. And I, I guess it sounds pretty straightforward when we say it like that. But at the end of the day, so you know, we spend the time to look at what was happening. 
And so this is with grapes, you know, we've done it with, we've done it with pastures to look at, you know, the nutrition content that the cattle were eating. We've looked at it from uh, with blueberries, we've looked at it with salad, we've looked at it with uh, avocados and various other crops. And some of the things that were really interesting is that we are increasing the nutrition content of that food. And I believe that the future of food production is not necessarily in its quantity, but more importantly, in its quality. Because there's a few things that are impacted. First of all, shelf life is impacted. Um, the quantity of nutrition required, the units of food needed to produce to feed a population decrease. Because our bodies are looking for nutrition. We're not looking for bulk food that just fills our bellies. We're looking for food that actually satisfies our body's needs for nutrition. And so if we're able to create healthier food, um, A, we don't need to make as much, and B, we're getting a lot further with it. And so just in this example alone, you're seeing um, you know, an increase in magnesium, an increase in zinc, an increase in boron. Um, there are some that have gone down a little bit, and the reason for that can be a lot of, a, a lot of different uh, there, there's some theories behind that, but really, if a plant's able to have a balanced access to nutrition, then it's really looking and taking what it needs as opposed to taking what it has to, to stay alive. When you're in a stressed environment, plant take what they can to stay alive, just like a human. If you're given the choice between five different meals, uh, you'll take the one that you enjoy or that you feel is the best for you. Um, if I narrow that down to two or only one option, you're going to eat what's on the table because you're trying to stay alive. You're trying to survive. And so by increasing the capacity of plants to reach out into the soil and get the nutrients that they're looking for, they're changing what they're bringing up. Um, Liedberg's law of the minimum is the best example of this, is that a plant's, uh, a plant's genetic potential is really limited uh, by the nutrient that is least available. And so by increasing biology, the response between a plant and that biology is how we're able to have a better access to nutrients. And so this is really where I think there's some interesting opportunities uh, because we're able to grow better food, more food, and systems that are very simple. Um, to put into perspective, um, and again, I'm using what I know and what we've developed, a 50, a 50 gram pouch of soil inoculum treats a thousand square feet uh, of, 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 of field. And you do that once a year. And so a very small quantity of material is able to help your field in a long period. And now it's not a permanent impact that you're having, but fundamentally what's important here is that once you started and you've primed that pump, if you're, act, if you're gonna use the right processes afterwards, you've started your soil to be independent again. And this is fundamentally the importance of all of this. It is the capacity of farmers and food producers to create food for the lowest cost possible in the most environmentally sustainable way. And microbiology is how the systems were built from day one. This is how evolution has given us plants. And this is how I believe we're able to produce food for the next level and the next generations. Thank you. I don't know if there's any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we are a bit late uh, in our program. So uh, those who have questions may address you either through the chat or through your email. Uh, sure. And I would like to now invite our last speaker of this part, the first part of lecture, uh, Professor Paris Kuavkan.